Hey guys, how's it going? Today we're going to take a look at all of our beautiful dahlia blooms out here. It's been a really pretty year again with the dahlias. They've reacted or grown just a little bit differently for us this year than they have the past few years and I'll talk through that. But I want to show you our setup and just get some close-ups on these gorgeous gorgeous flowers. So this is our dahlia patch right here planted May 22nd. You'll notice that they're overall a smaller size than they've been the last couple of years and I'm hearing that as kind of a common theme this year and I think well at least in our area we had a very long cold spring and it took them a long time to germinate. I wish I would have counted the days because it seemed like it took between two and three weeks to start seeing green like I was starting to get worried that maybe they weren't going to grow at all like I had done something wrong even though I'd done everything the same but they have been every bit as productive as they have been in past years and honestly <laughs> it is easier to walk down the aisles this year than any other year typically they're all just everywhere just all over in the aisles and huge and just yeah Kind of, they kind of take over the space. So it's kind of nice to have them a little bit more tame this year. In terms of infrastructure, we've got six 60 foot rows and one 47 foot row. So we've got, you can see the six here, and then right by that big trellis, there's a 47 foot row right there. The T posts here are spaced roughly seven and a half feet apart from one another. And typically we run a nylon rope at about two feet. This one looks like it's at about one and a half feet and then another one a little higher so that as the dahlias grow you can you know lash the dahlias to it stake the dahlias to the rope this year we've kind of gone with the florida weave method you can see how it goes around both sides and it kind of sandwiches the plant overall i feel like it's been a good system i mean clearly you can see everything looks way more upright but everything is quite a bit smaller this year um, but all, along the way, we have had to add extra supports, extra strings to help, you know, some of the bigger ones stay up, but they're, they're looking pretty good. We irrigate with drip tape right here. So it's got emitter holes every six inches, and we feel like that's the best coverage for them. The first time I set up drip for the dahlias, I used uh, drip tape that had emitter holes every 12 inches, and it just wasn't enough. I thought that that would be the most efficient use of water because we're spacing dahlias, so they're spaced out 12 inches apart from one another uh, but it just it wasn't enough coverage so we pulled it halfway through the season swapped it with the six inch spacing emitters and it's worked like a charm ever since and drip tape you can go so much further than other types of drip tubing because we've got in this area here we've got six 60 foot rows of dahlias and then there's one 47 foot row of dahlias but even in like this section here, we've got two 60 foot rows of drip tape in every single aisle here. And it just, it's beautiful coverage. It is a little squirrely though. See this, the heat does that. And like when it turns on and off, like the pressure of the water kind of makes it do squirrely things. Even if we tack it down with bricks, landscape staples, whatever. Still, it works the best. When we plant these, we use an auger and just dig a hole every 12 inches, and then we put biotone starter fertilizer in the holes and land and sea compost in the holes. And that's all they get all season long from us in terms of fertilizer, food, anything like that. I mean, maybe we would get more production if we would do more fertilizing, but they are just, they're productive, I think, either way. One thing we have dealt with in this dahlia area, no insect pressure, like there's no aphids, no earwigs, none of that sort of business. So I haven't had to bait with anything, which is awesome. If we did have earwigs in here, I would use the Captain Jack's, is it the bug and slug killer? It's just a little granulated, it's a bait that you can sprinkle around the base of your plants. That's what we use in other areas of our garden and it works really well. But here's what we've been dealing with just recently. Look at this, powdery mildew. That's not something we see in our garden very often because we're so dry here. But here's what happens in the early fall, especially, or even in the spring, when you have days that get really quite warm, like I think we're in the high 80s for the next few days, but it dips really low at night. So like, I think we're low 40s right now at night. That's quite a swing. I mean, almost a 50 degree swing, 40 to 50 degree swing. Um, and the humidity is higher at night, which it is right now. You wake up in the morning and it feels like if you were to walk through your grass, like the sprinklers just ran. It's so wet, like the dew is just everywhere. And it's kind of the perfect breeding ground for fungal things like this. Since we're so late in the season, if this was to happen in the spring, I would start treating it right away. But since we're so late, I'm just gonna let it go because a lot of times uh, powdery mildew on dahlias, it, it, if it's really severe, it can really take down production and you know it just kind of hampers the ability 
of your plant to photosynthesize. It won't bloom as much and that sort of thing. Uh, but these plants don't have long before they're going to succumb to a frost. So I'm not gonna worry about it now. If this was to happen earlier in the season, I would probably treat it. I would spray the plants um, and you know, you can use horticultural oil, neem oil, um, some, there are a lot of home remedies I haven't tried yet, but you can Google all kinds of different things for powdery mildew. This time of year, uh, probably in the next week or two, if I wanted to treat it, I would, I would opt for a sulfur option but you have to be careful with the sulfur spray. It's an organic way to, to handle it, uh, but it can harm plants if it's too hot. So you wanna be very mindful of reading the label and making sure you use it at the right time of year. So anyway, in this case, I'm not gonna to worry too much about it. I'm thankful it's not something we deal with that often. And this year, apart from just a few varieties, just a handful that I really wanna save, we are going to attempt mulching these, covering them, and trying to get them through winter. So I'm going to attempt not digging these, not storing them, because it is a huge process. It's crazy with these dahlias, the difference in workload between off season and on season. Like getting the plants from planting to this point, no problem, piece of cake, low maintenance, hands off, so easy. But off season, digging them, cleaning them, storing them, labeling them, and then dividing them, oh my gosh, it is so much work. And it's not when you're just dealing with a handful, but I think we've got 400 and some. And you know, I know there's a lot of people who grow a lot more than that. Uh, if I grew more than that and I was digging them, I would need to get a tractor implement or something, some kind of machine that could help us out because we spend weeks doing the chore with the dahlias. So I'm hoping, and I've seen other people do it successfully. We are a zone six. I think dahlias are what a zone eight, uh, but we are gonna heavily mulch them. So we're gonna use grass clippings, shredded leaves, things like that, wood chips, and do a super, super thick layer of mulch. And then we're gonna tarp each row, hopefully to keep heat in. I think heat, keeping the heat in and keeping the water out is kind of the main goal. Uh, because when we store them in our root cellar, we store them in the tiniest, like in vermiculite, with the tiniest bit of moisture around them, but I never add any additional water ever. Um, they just come out beautiful. So I just, the only worry about keeping them out here is one that they'd get too cold or that they'd get too much water and they would rot. So it's gonna be an experiment. Uh, the thing about overwintering them, you would have to eventually dig some of them because they will eventually get so big that they'll start to be unhealthy plants. So if we can get them in a rotation to where I'm just maybe digging one row a year instead of doing all of them, that would just be so awesome. That is pretty much it as far as the details on these dahlias. Now, usually when we do a dahlia tour, we take a walk through all the aisles, look at each one of the plants, and I wanna do it a little bit differently uh, because right now it's full sun and it looks pretty harsh. It's hard to see details on plants and the mosquitoes are out like crazy. So we're gonna do the tour somewhere else. We are going to take a look at all of these gorgeous blooms sitting here on this table. This is a representation of every single variety that we have out in that garden. I just had the best time setting this thing up this morning. I mean, just, I made a label for each one of them. First I walked the aisles and I got all of the variety names. Then I went and scavenged a bunch of jars up in the barn loft, got them all filled with water, made my labels, and then just walked the aisles and picked pretty flowers and set them all up. It was just, it was so nice. Real quick, here's my little diagram. This is how I knew what labels to make. I just walked along each row and then wrote down what varieties I had in each row. So there's the six long ones and then we've got one short one. Little contribution from Samantha Grace right there. And then Benjamin was out here while I was cutting dahlias and he made this super sweet zinnia bouquet. He really wanted me to study the bouquet after every flower edition. It was so cute. Oh my goodness, you guys, are you ready for this? <laughs> there are so many gorgeous ones. Now, I did leave a few out in the garden. I think we've got 60 some here, 65, 68, something like that. There are some I don't know the names of. Uh, a few of them made, a, made it in here, like this big, glorious, deep purple one. On the camera screen, it looks a little brighter, so I'm not sure how it's going to translate, but this is a beautiful, deep purple, and then there's this purple one right here I don't know the name of. And I might find the tags later on, I'm not sure, but I rooted around a lot of the plants and I didn't see anything, but they are pretty. Okay, so I think we should just start right here on the front corner and move our way around the table. So this first one, it's called Bee Man. And I picked this one up from Swan Island Dahlias this year. It's a new one to our garden, super productive plant, but I bought it because Bee Man is my dad's nickname for Benjamin. And I thought it would be fun to have a dahlia with that name. I just posted a picture of a bouquet of these on Instagram and oh my goodness, they're just gorgeous. 
I love that the dark color is in toward the interior of the petals and then you've got the white on the outer part. It gives it a glow quality. And then we have Gitz Perfection, which is a beautiful lemony yellow. These range though, these blooms, you'll see them on the plant from a very clear lemon yellow all the way to like almost white. You can see a little bit of white in the two petals here. You can see a fully white petal right back here, but each flower will look completely different. I love the structure of these. Would you call that a cactus type? I'm not sure. Next, we've got Rosy Wings, which is a collarette dahlia, which I love. Love, love these flowers. I love that fluffy inner layer. This one's just such a sweet pink. Honeybees love this type of dahlia because they're open. You know, the pollen is accessible as opposed to, you know, like this La Encresse, which is gorgeous. And I love to arrange with this type of flower, but you can see that the pollen isn't as accessible as it is in this type or in like the bumblebee. Look at that. I think this might be one of the most interesting dahlias we have out there right now. I think just the high, high contrast between that red and then the inner layer that has white and red is just very interesting. And the bumblebee variety has been incredibly productive. I would say it's more productive than rosy wings even. Then we've got Arbitax, which is just a beautiful sweet pink with the purple tips. You see those purple tips right up there and there's quite a bit of white mixed in. It's just another one that kind of has that glow, but I love that sweet color of pink. I think it's just so pretty. And these are a nice size too. They're not enormous like dinner plates. Dinner plates are awesome. Like we've got some Cafe Alley Royals right here, but they're a lot harder to arrange with because they're such, they're such huge flowers. These are a little bit easier to tuck in. And the Cafe Alley Royals have a lot more pink in them. See that? We've got Cafe Alley's over on the other side. Let me just give you a quick peek. See how the Cafe Alley's are just, they're cream. They're cream colored, beautiful. With that kind of latte color and with that kind of really soft peachy brown color in the center and then the soft cream on the tips. This one has a similar vibe, just a little bit more pink in there. And then we've got another pom-pom called the Nijinsky, which is a super vibrant kind of magenta pink, really pretty. I like the clear colors too. You know, it's really fun when you've got them that have multiple colors in, but I really appreciate these two. This is a new one this year and I love this one. It's called Innocence. It's like the Cafe Con Leche, which we'll look at here in a minute, but it's just a little bit bigger and has a little tiny bit more pink in it. And I just think it is gorgeous. Kind of skipping around a little bit, but I wanted to show you the Cafe Con Leche. See, these are a little bit smaller, don't have as much pink. These are like a smaller version of the Cafe Ale, like color wise. And I think they're so delicate looking, but the innocence just gives you that little bit of pink in there. Now this next one is not Natalie G. <laughs> it was labeled Natalie G, but it's an orange one. And I don't know, I can't remember what kind I grew that has that kind of color. I mean, I had some called brown sugar, but they were a little bit deeper than this, if I remember right. They're still really beautiful, but I'm gonna have to pitch this name. I think Natalie G's are much more pink than this. It was actually comical how poorly our Dahlia patch was labeled. There were so many mislabeled. And like I tried to plant all the pinks in the first row or first couple of rows and then I did, what did I do next? I did yellows and then I did whites and then I did oranges and it's a total mishmash of color. Like I'll have my row of pinks and a whole bunch of them are yellow and there's a red one in there. I mean, it's just, it's just crazy. That's another reason why I'm excited we're not storing them. Then we've got Vasio Magos. Magos, Vasio Magos, I don't know. Big, beautiful pink dinner plate style. Love, love these. They're just so big and show-stopping. I just think they're so pretty. And then we've got one right next to it called Clyde's Choice. Perfect color for this time of year. And it looks really beautiful. I mean, with all these autumnal colors and then toss in some white right there. In fact, if you look over the table, we have a lot of kind of autumn colors. Clyde's Choice though, tons of tubers. If you want to grow one, whoops, if you want to grow one and you want to be able to divide it and share with friends, plant that one. So right below that we have Labyrinth, which, okay, that's such a pretty color. It's just kind of tropical looking. You've got the apricot peach with kind of the creamy tips and then there's some pink mixed in there. And they've got the dinner plate vibe, but they also have a little bit of a wild twist to their petals. I just think they're so pretty. And then we've got one called Spartacus. 
huge, big red dahlias. I've actually used quite a number of these in, in arrangements. They look really pretty mixed in with raspberries and some of the zinnias that we have out there. I just think it's so nice. Then we've got another new one for this year called La Luna. I'm going to be digging this one along with a couple of the other ones we've showed you already, but oh, isn't that just perfection right there? We've had quite a number of, of uh, flowers off this one. I only have two plants. Uh, one of the plants has a tiny bit more yellow in the flower than this one does. I just think that that is gorgeous and the perfect name. Then we've got another colorette called Cherubino. I need to make my mama bouquet with some of these in them. I think she would really like these. I think they're so pretty. Look at that fluffy inner layer, but they just look so pure. Then we've got Old Rose Mix, which, you know, a mix of varieties. I did buy a few mixes. In fact, you'll see quite a number of the mixes over here. Um, this is all that came up in that patch, but I really like the colors here. Look at that. Now that one's very tropical looking. Just the bright pink and kind of that bright mango-y color and then mix it in with these beautiful, like almost water lily type. They're so gorgeous. And then we have one called Junkyard Dog. <laughs> I don't know who named that. This was the only bloom I had on it right now. There's a whole bunch of buds. I've seen lots of blooms from it this year and I wish I had one that was fully complete, but you can get, you get the picture of what that one looks like. You've got the red with kind of that chartreuse yellow base of each one of the petals. And then of course it's open face, so the bees love it. Then we've got a variety called Jenna. I included two flowers in this one because you can see the difference on one plant. These came off the same exact plant. And so one of them's got white tips. One of them has like a little bit of white in it. There's a few more tips right there, but I just think it's so unique when that happens. Then we've got polka right here. The beautiful soft pink with that bright glowy yellow center. This one has a different leaf structure than a lot of your other dahlias. The leaves are a lot more thread-like, like needle-like. It's an interesting plant. Then we've got Pulvatin Supreme, which is another new one from this year. It looks kind of similar to our La Luna, just smaller. Look at that bloom structure. Mmm like smooth, smooth and creamy is what it looks like. And then the only bloom on this plant is kind of spent. This one's called chickadee. These plants have succumbed to uh, the powdery mildew more than others. Um, and this one didn't perform, if I remember right, all that well for me last year. So we'll leave it in the ground and see what happens, but you can at least see the color there and the structure. They always kind of have this weird structure to them. And then we have pink mix, which had had a lot of different pinks in it, but this is the only one that was blooming in that section at the moment. Beautiful, bright pink. I mean, bright, vibrant pink. And then we've got Melody Dora. Isn't she beautiful? So many of these, like I, I lack for a better word than glow. They just kind of have that glow quality. Mm, so pretty. And here's Pooh. Isn't that so cute? Another colorette. I grew these for the first time last year and I really enjoyed them. I thought they were so pretty and they were productive. We had so many tubers from this variety. The bees love them and they work really well into autumn arrangements. Then we've got Glory of Hemsteed. I don't know if I'm saying that right and I'm pretty sure I spelled it wrong. I think there's too many E's in there, but it's a beautiful clear yellow. I really enjoy this one. We've got quite a number of them. I think I'm gonna at least dig one plant. So I've got some of the tubers for this one. Then we've got Sonic Bloom. This is one that came from Florette. She sent out a couple of years ago. And this is of all the uh, tubers, of all the dahlias in all of our garden, the Sonic Bloom and the Terracottas have been our most productive varieties. I love how this one looks autumnal, but there's a lot more pink in it. You know, we've got a lot of orange. There's a lot of orange and yellow but this one looks more pink, but it still has that warm undertone. And I love how fluffy they are. Oh, pretty. Then we've got Mambo, which is a super interesting one. Look at that color. And I don't have any others that have that, um, I don't even know what word. See how the ends of the petals have those little, what's that called, the cuts in it, lobes? I don't know, but they're tipped with yellow. So it gives it just a really unique look really unique and it very much so gets smoky toward the middle part of the flower, smoky pink. Then we've got Penny Lane, which has been a favorite of mine. 
these are a little bit more vibrant than they were for us last year. So you can see many different colors from the same plant. I love them when they come out looking like this right here. The white with that kind of melony orange color. I think it's so pretty. And then some of them have more yellow and some of them have more of that kind of reddish orange in it. Um, but it's just a beautiful kind of almost free form dahlia. Right back here we have the romantic mix which just ended up maybe I can see it better from the other side. Swinging around the back here. It's just a mix of some beautiful colors here. It's almost like the cafe con leche color with that beast right there. It's crazy. Anyway there's usually a little bit more pink in there but that's what we got from that patch today anyway. And then we've got Kelvin floodlight. Whoa that's a big flower. Look at how huge that is. A little bit different from our La Luna. So a lot more cream in that one, a lot more yellow here. They're just gorgeous. Mm, I love that color, so fresh looking. Right next to that one, we have a big fire engine red bloom called Hercules. Look at that. Oh, I've made a couple arrangements with these two. It's super productive in terms of blooms and tubers and just really pretty. And while many of you know, I don't typically use any red in my normal flower beds, out in the cut flower garden, I just go kind of crazy with color and I really enjoy seeing it out in that kind of setting where it's just kind of a big jumble of color. It's just, it's such a fun thing to have out here. Right below that, we have one called Ginger Snap, which is a really pretty, just light orange color. This one has a lot of blooms on the plants right now. It's been really productive. Then right beside that one, we have the Bridal Bouquet mix, which is a mix of a lot of different ones that we've seen already, kind of like the Cafe Au Lait and Labyrinth kind of look. Um, there's some white in there. It's just a really pleasant, pleasing mix. Colorado Classic, another super productive one in terms of tubers. This one will produce huge blooms and then blooms that are kind of this medium size right here. This is another one that's very productive in the way of tubers. Like it'll produce so, so many tubers. And so you've got like the pink tips with the white interior, really pretty. We already looked at the Cafe Con Leche, which honestly, top five probably on this table. I love this one. Then we have our No Namer. So if any of you guys know what this is, please tell me. In this jar, I had to squeeze two in because I was running out of jars out here, but we've got Yellow Bird, which is a beautiful, clear, lemony yellow, colorette style dahlia. And then we've got another colorette called Mary Evelyn. Isn't that pretty? It kind of like kind of close, but yeah, this one's got more of a, a intense red color, much more saturated. Then we've got a brown sugar. This was the only bloom that I have. I use a ton of these. See, I didn't, let me, let me bring this one over here. Uh, I don't think that that one's brown sugar. This one is kind of aged. It's the only example I had, but anyway, I really like the colors of this one. And then there's Cabana Banana, which is a beautiful yellow, kind of a cactus style with tiny blush of pink and a little bit of white in there. Just a really fun looking one. And then Gouda Shink, which this, I love this one. I just almost kind of looks porcupine-esque to me. I don't know if that even makes sense but I love how each flower looks a little different. So see how this one's much more yellow. This one's kind of a mix of the two here, and this one's much more orange, but they're kind of striped in a way. So pretty, this one has very delicate stems. So you do have to be a little bit careful. They're really easy though to manipulate in a flower arrangement though. The big ones, like the big dinner plates are a lot harder, much more rigid stems. Then we've got one called Giggles. I'll be digging this one for sure. I think the color is beautiful. I love how pronounced the little fluffy layer is right there in the center. And I just love that kind of melony peach color. I think it's so nice. We've got Lake Ontario, which I bought this one because we live in a town called Ontario and these happen to be my high school colors, red and yellow, cardinal and corn is what they call them. So you've got the yellow with a little brushing of red, but then each one of the petals, if you look in close, has a red margin. So it looks very defined. Then we've got Hapet Blue Eyes. Isn't that gorgeous? When I bought this one, I didn't know for sure if I was gonna like it. Sometimes bicolor blooms that contrast like this, I don't tend to go towards those, but I love this one. I think it's so, so extremely beautiful. Then we've got the dinner plate pastel mix. So again, another kind of, look at that crazy one right there, like labyrinth. 
Just another mix of beautiful creamy white and kind of peach colors. There's our Cafe LA that we already looked at. Then we've got a white dinner plate called Snow Country. I got those tubers at Home Depot like four years ago, something like that. Anyway, they've been a good keeper and they're very productive. And then in this back vase, we've got Lady Liberty, another white one. I've got quite a bit of white. And when you get big white ones, whether it be this one or that one, you kind of need to, I don't know, I kind of want to decide which one I want to keep because I don't necessarily need to have a bunch that are relatively the same size. You know what I'm saying? Oh, but it's so hard to eliminate any varieties. This one is a new one this year called Lights Out, a new one to me that I bought for the patch. Lights Out, deep, deep burgundy. Love that one. It's almost kind of black in the center. Then we've got Holly Hill Miss White, which super productive in the tuber department. Super productive, crazy. More than the Long Crest, which looks similar to this. See, that one has a little bit more yellow in the center. This one's all the way white, but this one will create a ton of tubers. And then right below it, we've got the Terracotta, which are just kind of a wild terracotta color. Then we've got Clearview Daniel, which is a new one from this year as well. Uh, but you know, in my opinion, I kind of, I kind of prefer the Glory of Hemsteed a little bit more of an open flower for that kind of size of yellow. I don't know. I mean, it's a very pretty flower. Really pretty color. In this jar right here, we have a colorette called Easy Does It. And you've got, again, the yellow and the red. I really do like a lot of autumn colors and dahlias because a lot of times when they're blooming at their peak, it's autumn. <laughs> you kind of are craving those colors and I find myself using a lot of those colors. The other one in here is Vixen. Isn't that perfect? I love it. Then we've got Emperor. Isn't that amazing? Huge, big lavender flower. And then here is Noel, that white and red Christmassy look. I think that that one was named very appropriately. This was the only flower on the plant today. This one doesn't produce a ton of flowers or it hasn't produced a ton this year. And I can't remember that it produced an enormous amount last year but I still think it's a very interesting and unique flower. Then we have Night Silence, which is smoky mauve, kind of that brown undertone, really beautiful. And then this is an interesting one called Star Child. This plant is wild, wild. Like it is twisting and going all over the place, but I love the unique structure of those flowers. I mean, that looks like nothing that we have here on this table. It almost kind of stands out like, did you mean to put it there? Is that a daisy? But it's a dahlia. And I think it's beautiful, beautiful filler flower, really. And then the last one, I think we've hit all of these, but the last one is called pumpkin. And this is another one that you'll see with different colors. So you've got a lot of red and yellow. This one's got a lot more red. This one's kind of a bicolor as well, maybe a little bit more on the orange side. So what do you guys think? What is your favorite one? I mean, can you even pick a favorite one? I just, it's incredible the amount of beauty that can come out of these plants. It's just, they're so gorgeous. It's always just such a satisfying thing to see out in the garden because you know, we have a lot of flower crops I'm experimenting with this year. You know, I left stock in the ground. It's kind of looking crummy, but pushing new stems. And you know, a lot of times you have to kind of put plants through their, through their paces and try different things out to see what you can do with them. These are always reliable. They're always productive. They're always full of color this time of year while some of those other things don't look so super hot. And I'm just really hoping, hoping that these plants make it through the winter. We'll see what happens. I don't know what kind of winter, you kind of usually hear rumors about what kind of winter you're gonna have. Like anybody can really predict it. But anyway, we'll see what happens. Hopefully um, they, they survive. And I hate to say that there's any drawback using these types of flowers and cut arrangements, but if I had to pick out one drawback with these plants is that they don't have a very long vase life. Usually it's between five and seven days. You do want to pick a flower that's at peak. So let's take a look. Oh, I haven't looked at any of these, but take a look at the back side of the flower. If the petals still look good, then you'll have the longest vase life. You can see that a few of them are showing some signs of deterioration. So you're probably looking at maybe like the five to six day mark on a flower like this. Uh, let's take a look at another one like this one right here. That one looks pretty darn fresh. You might get a full week out of that sort of flower. But the thing with dahlias is that you do wanna wait until they are fully open to the point where you want them to be 
for your arrangement when you cut them because they do not continue to open as they're in the vase. So like if you, you know, pick this one right here, it's not gonna open. That bud will not open in a flower arrangement. Um, or like this one here. You can see this one's fully open. This one's only half open. This one won't continue to open. Um, so you do want to wait. There's kind of that fine line. You wanna wait until your flower's ready, but not too long. Let's look at the back of this cafe. Not too bad. Little bit of deterioration there looking pretty fresh. This one doesn't look very great. I didn't even realize that when I brought it in here. There's some browning there, a little bit of tatter on the side. But I just make fresh cuts and add floral preservative to the water, which I have right here. Any kind of floral, flower food will work. I'm just gonna enjoy these dahlias right here just as they are for their whole entire, their lifespan of the blooms. I think this is just such a beautiful display and I've never set anything up like this before. And it was just so fun to be able to see everything all in one space. I mean, I really enjoy walking through the garden or, you know, we go on drives every single night on the, the gator with the kids. And I love seeing all the color and the beautiful blooms out there, uh, but seeing everything all condensed like this is awesome. Now, all of these jars that I got out of the loft in the barn, I do plan on doing a free flower day, maybe even this weekend. We have friends coming into town that wanted to do some things in the garden, which is so fun. So we might do that this weekend. If not, it'll be maybe the next week. Uh, but I do plan on just keeping them out here, filling them up and taking them downtown and giving flowers away. And you guys, that is it for today. I just thought it would be fun to kind of recap the dahlia season and talk about how this one went. You know, every year is a little bit different with every single crop. Some years you have amazing luck, some years, um, you know, so, so I would say that this is a pretty good year, even though the plants are smaller, super happy with the results here. And we will bring you along when we start to cut the dahlias back and mulch them up. Um, just so you can see that process, it might work. We'll see. So anyway, thank you guys so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it and we will see you in the next one. Bye.